Good afternoon, everybody. You guys want to get started now? All right. Uh, my name is Luke Snuski. The last name is Polish. The accent is American. And uh, this will be the first time I'm talking about <clears throat> a million ways to live. A year ago, I got back to Auckland after uh, traveling for a bit. I'll tell you all about the project in a second. But before I do, a little bit about my background. I was a professional athlete. I played quarterback for, that's American football. You guys know American football? In Italy, uh, before I became a CPA, desk work was not for me. So I started getting back pain, neck pain, elbow pain. And I said, no, I think I'm going to go back to being active. Became a personal trainer. Started attending summits just like you guys, reading books, working at gyms, doing th that thing. And uh, really quickly after personal training, I realized that my workouts didn't cure cancer. They weren't the end-all, be-all. So I needed to keep refining my skills, learning more. So I went into massage, massage work, neuromuscular therapy. And even then, you can't fix everybody with just exercise and soft tissue work. So I started getting into nutritional coaching, uh, precision nutrition, functional diagnostic nutrition. We were testing stools. We were testing adrenals. We were doing everything to change, um, to help people. Finally, after trying all these different, I guess, modalities and ways to help people, you get to the end and you're still not helping everyone. You're still not going to the depth that you really want to. So I started turning my attention to meditation and mindfulness. And that's actually why I'm back in Auckland, or one of the reasons I'm back in Auckland. I'm a PhD student here studying addiction and psychology, working with mindfulness and meditation. So that's my background. But the goals for today, um, I'm going to tell you about Million Ways to Live, which is a book I wrote. Uh, three years ago, two years ago, three years ago. I'd been planning it three years before that, and it turned into an international documentary web series. I, I, um, and I'll tell you about some stories from the road, about some of the things I learned. But most importantly, it's the lessons that I learned throughout the process and how they could help you and how they could help your clients, because that's why you're really here, is how do you become a better fitness professional? How do you help people more effectively and efficiently? And uh, yeah. So when I was in Santa Monica, that's where I lived when I was in the States, I had my own personal laboratory. I had a wellness studio where I pretty much did whatever I want because we had a massage room, we had an infrared sauna, we had a team of trainers, and we did everything from, it wasn't clients that walked in and said, oh, I just want to work out three times a week and lose 10 pounds. No, our clients were, here are the keys to my life, do whatever you want. And we had a team across every specialty, which was great. Um, but the crazy part was everyone had different goals. So David, he lost 45 kgs in six months. Diego was a client that, um, he was on the cover of Men's Health Latin America. Holly was a professional female boxer. Sky was a business professional that worked for uh, some executive. Um, but the things that we were seeing, and what's really important, is that no single diet was working for these people. David lost 45 kgs. He was eating predominantly meat. No veggies, no fruit, just meat. And I'm not joking. Got his blood test back, cholesterol was fine at the end of the process. More on him later. Diego was carb loading. Every three days we were doing 80 grams of carbs for his dinner. So Holly, vegan professional fighter. So definitely different supplements, definitely different kind of diet regimen. Um, another thing we noticed is that different clients responded to different types of movement. Some people were responding well to low intensity, High vol or low intensity cardio over a long period of time. Some were reacting well to cardio strength training, high density circuits with full body movements. Um, another thing we were noticing is that we, we were getting more results when we were investing our time in working in rather than working out. Because working out is another stress for our client, right? It's controlled injuries, that's what exercise is. You control the breakdown of muscle tissue so it can regrow bigger and faster. But it's still an injury. It's still a stress on the body. So if that stress is not managed, then you're not going to have any results. So we were noticing that when we were investing time in educating our clients on how to recover correctly, how to rest appropriately, well, then we started seeing better and better results. So one of the things um, over the three and a half years that I had my place in Santa Monica, what I saw was that I was getting more and more complex and complicated. I was doing all these saliva tests for adrenals. I was doing stool tests for gut bacteria. And it just got to the point that I'm like, what, what are we doing here? 
is this really what matters? Are we supposed to be trying to educate our clients and hormone theories and doing all these things? Or do we just want our clients to feel better in their body, get results, be more confident within themselves, and be empowered to control their own life? So eventually what I just decided that what life was about, what healthy living is all about, are these six things, like healthy lifestyle principles, real food, movement, rest and relaxation, lifelong learning, community, and love. And the reason they're principles is because they can be applied in a million different ways. Real food, as long as it's real, there's a, a million different ways to get real food into your body, right? Whether you're paleo, vegan. So this is sort of how we started working with our clients. We started looking at it from a more holistic perspective, from a more simple perspective, so that when we were communicating to clients, it was more real. They didn't have to be confused by the technical jargon. They didn't need to know which muscles were being activated with a reverse lunge. <coughs> It was just about movement. It was just about getting real food. Uh, so this inspired kind of um, a world adventure. So I wanted to see all these healthy lifestyle principles in action. I wanted to see people and cultures from around the world and how they were living, how healthy and happy people around the world were living by these six healthy lifestyle principles. So why did I do it? Well, I wanted to travel around the world. That's a good reason. Um, another reason, in Santa Monica, speaking about health philosophies, nutritional philosophies, and exercise philosophies is like discussing, is like discussing politics and religion. You don't do it, because it's just arguments and debates, and people hate each other when they're on opposing sides. And I'm like, you know what? I think there's more to learn from opposing viewpoints than there is to disagree about. So I wanted to kind of cultivate some open-mindedness and acceptance around um, these issues. And then, most importantly, I wanted to find and share inspirational people and stories from around the world. And you guys are here doing this summit. You guys are doing a lot of learn by doing um, talks and presentations. And I wanted to learn by being within the culture, being within um, all of these theories and stories and articles and books I had read in the past. So the trip lasted a year. I went to 38 countries and six different continents. And we made 56 episodes. Um, it was really intense learning how to film, edit, and do everything on the road by yourself. And, well, it wasn't by myself. It was with a small team. And um, I don't recommend traveling with a baby infant. Uh, he was six months old while we were traveling. So he's been to 22 countries. All right. So this is the first episode we shot. This is, I want you guys to see. I'm going to show you a few of the episodes. They're only three to five minutes long. This is a guy from Lexington, Kentucky. And really pay attention to the concept of real food here. When it comes to healthy eating, there's no such thing as a perfect diet. One man's food is another man's poison. That's why when we learned of someone who found health on a diet of raw meat, we weren't the least bit surprised. We were interested and wanted to learn more. Today on Million Ways to Live, we visit Lexington, Kentucky, where Derek Nance shows us how healthy living can look outrageous to an outsider and yet still be firmly grounded in healthy lifestyle principles. Six years ago, I was diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome. I was so weak, I couldn't even get up a flight of stairs without losing my breath. Doctors uh, didn't really give me much options. Uh, they suggested that I try antidepressant drugs to kind of help with the symptoms of depression. And I kept insisting that, you know, I'm not depressed, I'm just unhappy because I feel bad all the time. Derek pinpointed the underlying cause of his health woes in his diet specifically his intolerance to certain foods. Foods like yogurt and granola, considered to be healthy for most, simply didn't agree with Derek's digestive system. After trying different nutritional philosophies, he finally stumbled upon the Paleolithic diet in his research. Almost immediately, his body felt better. Yeah, before uh, I found this diet, you know, food was a real issue for me. I dreaded having to eat because I knew afterwards I would feel so terrible. So, I mean, it was a struggle for me day in and day out just to find foods that I could eat, that I could tolerate. And then once I transitioned over to this diet, within a couple of weeks, I noticed my digestion was working better than it had ever worked before. 
I got a cup of ram's blood right here. All the nutrients, all the electrolytes and minerals are already assimilated into the blood and you know, in the proper portions that your body needs. Perfect hydration. Cheers. It's good. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> These are my organ meats that I've put aside for our feast later. Uh, this is the kidneys. And then this is the liver. And this is a heart. And this is a testicle. Derek fully immersed us in the world of raw meat. We learned that eating meat in the raw form preserved the important enzymes that made it easier to digest. We learned that aging the meat produced probiotics, much like yogurt or sauerkraut, that Derek consumed to strengthen his digestive system. Derek only eats pasture-raised and humanely cared for animals. Not only is it more ethical, but he can actually taste the difference. And today, you know, I live a rich life. I, I do a lot of things. You know, I go hiking, I go swimming, I can uh, pole dance. I've taken up pole dancing. It's intense. It's what muscle groups you think you're working? All of them. All of them? Yeah. Yeah, like, I don't think I've had a core workout like that in a really long time. <laughs> After a great workout at Defiance Studios, we went to the local juice bar, which coincidentally is owned by none other than Derek's vegetarian girlfriend. Well, my, my girlfriend's a vegetarian, and when I first started coming over, I tried to to not bring my food with me. I tried to eat beforehand and not really throw it in her face. Slowly over time, you know, it got to the point where I could just throw whole pieces of lamb and lamb heads in her fridge and she wouldn't really notice. But it, it took a few months for, for her to get used to it. <laughs> Derek and Joanne teach us the importance of maintaining an attitude of non-judgment and acceptance. His lifestyle may not work for everyone, but for Derek, it's created a life full of health, energy and vitality, something many struggle to find. People in the community really don't know what to make of it because it does seem so far out of the norm because it just doesn't fit into their paradigm of what makes a healthy diet. Yeah, everybody's path to health is their own and I've led a very interesting and unique one to say the least. And I'm comfortable where I'm at today. And I have learned a lot, you know, about what's good for me personally. And that's where I'm at right now. <laughs> okay, so real food, the first principle. Um, if you guys really want to help your clients, we can't assume that a single diet or your approach is going to, is going to be what works for them. The things that make us different biologically, um, whether or not coffee is healthy for you is determined by a single gene in your body. If you're a fast metabolizer of it, it helps prevent heart disease. If you're a slow metabolizer of caffeine, guess what? It promotes it. You guys ever heard of 23andMe? No? It's a genetic test you can do. So it gets you all these cool things back, some knowledge about it. So I did the 23andMe to see if I could, uh, if I, what specifically to find out whether or not I was a fast or slow metabolizer of coffee caffeine. I was a slow metabolizer. I didn't stop drinking caffeine. <laughs> um, different, different hormones, different metabolic rates, all these things that make us different will determine what works best for you. If you are a fast metabolizer, sugar and carbohydrates are not a good source of energy for you. You gotta stick to fat. I need fat to keep weight on. If I start eating sugar, wasting away. Some people can't have fat. They need to have sugar because they're slow metabolizers. Cultural aspects. In Tanzania, have you, ever guys, have you guys ever heard of the hunting and gathering tribe, the Maasai? Yeah, so they don't eat their, um, their livestock, their cow and their, and their goats. And it's because it's a sign of wealth. So they collect them, so they wouldn't want to kill them because there goes some of their wealth. But in order to get protein and nutrients from the animal, do you guys know what they do? They drink the blood and the, and the milk. I'd play you that episode, it's just a bit weird. So you guys can go online and watch that one. Um, so yeah, they milk it, and obviously on special occasions, they cut it, they cut it, bleed it out a little bit, combine the blood, the blood coagulates in the milk, and you get a nice drink, superfood. 
Uh, there's also so socioeconomic factors when it comes to healthy eating and real food. Some of the cafes here in Auckland, the new raw food and vegan cafes, you guys seen the, price, <laughs> the prices of some of those items? <laughs> Man, if that, is, if that is your nutritional philosophy and that is what works best for you and that's the fuel that you do need in your body to thrive, I hope you have a trust fund. <laughs> And um, if you guys really want to empower your client, it has to start at home. The best thing you can do for them is tell them to throw out everything unhealthy in the kitchen pantry, in the fridge, in the freezer. Because if it's in the house, it's not a matter of if, it's when it's going to be eaten. And if you're like me, oh, I ate a piece of that Whitaker, Whitaker's peanut butter block, so I might as well eat the whole thing so it's out of the house. Right? You guys are laughing because you know it's true. <laughs> um, the, in terms of doing you do it yourself, and I think cooking is one of the best ways to get healthier with your food, regardless of what your nutritional philosophy is. I think there's three questions you have to ask yourself with every meal. What is it? That's the easiest. What is it? Tells you whether it's junk food, vegetables, meat, protein, whatever you want. Where did it come from? How is it prepared? If you can answer those three questions, you're in full control of the meal. And when you're cooking, you control where you're getting ingredients. Not only is it cheaper, but you're also improving the quality drastically. If you salt your food, if you think you're adding a lot of salt at home, oh, you feel guilty about that. Do you have any idea how much salt restaurants have to add to keep their meat and their food preserved? It's ridiculous. Fermentation, I ran into a guy, I filmed a guy in Perth, Australia, Jeremy Princey. Have you guys ever heard of the holistic lifestyler? Recommend following his Instagram, I recommend following him, he's fantastic. He showed me all these amazing ways of fermenting vegetables and these different concoctions, jalapenos, pineapples. He was, he was uh, do you guys know what fermentation is? I'm jumping ahead of myself, yeah? All you have to do is add salt. So he was showing me how to make sauerkraut. You just pound the sauerkraut, add whatever you want, leave it for two, three weeks. Three weeks later, you have healthy food full of probiotics. Here in Auckland, sauerkraut is becoming really popular. You guys have any idea how expensive it is? It's like 15 bucks for a little bag. Exactly. You make it at home for a few dollars at most. So do it yourself. If you want to empower your clients, it has to become a lifestyle. They have to be part of the process of the learning, engaging in it. Uh, movement. Movement, if you want your clients to stick to it. If, it want, if you want it to be a lifestyle, it has to be more than sets and reps and sets and reps and sets and reps. They'll get tired, fatigued, and bored. Uh, what, one of the things I learned is that the people that were moving, it was a form of expression. It was their passion coming out of their body. In Uganda, uh, we filmed a contemporary African dancer who, can who combined his tribal dancing with contemporary, contemporary form into this really unique piece. And when you watch him move, as fitness, prof fitness professionals, you would appreciate like what muscles are activating here, what's going on here. It's, but it's so fluid, so graceful, and it requires the full spectrum of flexibility, control, full body tension, and strength. It's just like everything wrapped into one. And complete loss of ego to move that way, right? Because how many of us like dancing in public, right? I don't. But to move that body that way is just something to um, witness. I also learned that movement trumps exercise each and every time. In Loma Linda, have you guys heard of the blue zones? There are regions around the world where there's a high percentage of people that live to be 100 years old. So the only blue zone in a non-traditional setting is in Southern California. It's in Loma Linda. And it's primarily due to the fact that there's so many, I think it's Seventh-day Adventists. I forget. I think it's Seventh-day Adventists. So they don't drink. They move every day. They ride their bikes everywhere. So we interviewed a centenarian who's 100 years old. He built his dream home at the age of 80. He retired from heart surgery at the age of 95. He said he was never stressed a day in his life. When he built his dream home at 80, he put his bedroom on the second floor so he would have to walk the stairs every day. Moses Lawn takes care of all of it. Moving every day. If your lifestyle, if you can inspire your clients, tell them, hey, park far away from the entrance of the supermarket. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. It's the circulation that will keep you healthy. It's the circulation resulting from movement. Um, and I'm a movement junkie. I played professional sports, like I said. I love kettlebells. I love, I do Muay Thai. I do salsa dancing. I love all movement. And traveling around the world, there was one thing that caught my attention so much, I was thinking about bringing it to Auckland. So in India, there's this ancient Indian sport called malakam. 
and it's as old as yoga, but no one's heard of it. You guys ever heard of Malakam? No. Well, this is Malakam. The incredible display of athleticism you just watched is a traditional Indian sport called Malakam. Even though it's nearly a thousand years old, it wasn't until 2013 that it was declared an official state sport of India. Today on Million Ways to Live, we explore the acrobatic world of Malakam and learn why this amazing sport is an essential part of Indian culture. Malkam is a part of Indian culture. It's known as the traditional Indian sport. And it is that unique sport which gives maximum exercise to the body in minimum possible time. And that's the fun of it. Malkam is a very unique kind of sport. See, in this sport, you work against the gravity. You pull yourself up. When you're holding the rope Malkam in your toe, you know, it's the kind of pressure. We don't use it anywhere. So each and every muscle gets used. In Malakam, you have to use all the muscles in the body. So I'm not saying these muscles involve this. These muscles involve this. From top to toe, all the muscles involved in Malakam. If you are going to a gym, you require a different equipment for your shoulders, a different equipment for your thigh. But here on Malkam, one piece of wood or one single cotton rope and you can practice on it all the time and enjoy. The world of Malakam is very diverse, with several variations and styles existing within the sport. Like bottle Malakam, which involves placing the pole on top of two layers of glass bottles before actually performing or group malakam, which involves players working together and contorting their bodies to create impressive symmetrical designs around the pole. But when it comes to the sport at the competitive level, however, there are only three foundational forms. Basically, there are three types of malakam which are included in the competitive events. The first e main event is pole malakam. It includes all your basic movements, holds, grips. Every fundamentals of malakam are covered in this. Rope is entirely different from that. Rope is like a moving and you have to balance yourself. It also includes intricate knots. We have to twist our body on the rope in such a way that we do not get stuck, but still maintain our grip. Team Malkham is uh, continuously moving, revolving. So it includes a lot of coordination and effort. It needs to have a counter motion so that you are balanced on top of, the, top of it. So that the motion of the Malkham is controlled, your own balance is controlled and then you, you can perform a different positions or asanas on it. Jumping into my first Malakam training session was fun, challenging, but probably one of the hardest things I've ever attempted. I only lasted about five minutes before completely tiring out. After many of the athletes offered up their help in coaching, I realized something important. All the athletes practice together regardless of their age and there's an underlying cultural reason for this. Indian culture, age is not a factor. I learn from my student. I am not give anything to him. He has that ability. Just I molded that ability. And I learn from him. This is our Indian culture. Guru, then Shishya. Then Shishya will become a Guru. Then Guru will Shishya. Here, that same culture they have followed. Children in India start Malakam from a very early age. The daily training routines develop discipline and concentration that will benefit them as they grow older. Whether they are a boy or a girl, Malakam is a great way of molding these kids into physically and mentally capable young adults. Malakam basically helps you develop flexibility, strength, stamina, right from a very young age. If you start it at a later age, say like 15, 16, it is a bit difficult as the body starts becoming rigid as we grow up. The muscles start tightening, the bones start getting hard. So flexibility becomes a bit of an issue. So starting at an early age gives us a very good advantage. So more girls need to do Malkam because it gives you a different level of confidence. So when they see Malkam first, 
uh, they think no, they become very reluctant. Like you know, I don't, I don't think I can do that. But at the end of the session, when they actually climb up, when they do the entire routine, they feel so much confident. There's a smile on their face. So that fear gets automatically turned into the confident. Psychologically, they start thinking, okay, I don't think anything is difficult for me anymore. Malakam is all about creating access to the masses. A single Malakam poll allows dozens of children to practice and train, and all of the coaches I spoke with teach their students for free. That's how they were coached, so now they're paying it forward to the next generation. Not only does this mean that the sport of Malakam will continue to excel, but it also builds, strengthens, and supports the local community. Next principle, rest and relaxation. So this is something I learned, I was starting to learn before I left for the trip. Um, I told you about my client, David, lost 45 kgs in six months. And obviously you guys, if you guys work with clients, you know that people hit plateaus when they're trying to lose weight. And if you can break through those plateaus, that's the important part. That's how you keep the change going. And with David, he had lost like 12 pounds in his first couple months. And he had a plateau for, plateau for three weeks. And um, I figured out that the problem was me. I started pushing him more because as he was plateauing, I'm like, okay, well, we need to make the exercises and workouts more intense. We need to, you need to train with me more often. And then when it finally clicked that I was overworking and overstressing his body, I'm like, okay, how about this? For 21 days or 14 days, you disappear from me. You sleep nine hours a night. You do a couple hikes a week where you're just walking in nature. And when you plateau again, then you'll come back to me. In 14 days, he lost 21 pounds. And it wasn't until he didn't lose th weight for three days that I said, okay, come on back and we'll start training again. And then the weight loss started happening again. So progress and the results that we want from our training do not happen during the workout. I've already told you guys that. You're breaking the body down. The results happen while you're recovering and resting. So a lot of the times our clients' lives are so complex, so stressed out, that adding to their lifestyle, adding more things to do, more stresses, more things to care about, is going to detract from their results. So simplify, simplify, simplify. Find the things in their life that are unnecessary and get rid of those first. Uh, if you want to add one thing, what's the first thing you should add? Sleep. Sleep. No one's sleeping, right? Uh, from the trip, I'd... Uh, you guys know that the Nordic Scandinavian countries are big in the sauna, especially Finland and Sweden. Um, I worked with the doctor of their, their like, what's the, what's the boating stuff called? What's the sport called itself, the, the big boats here? Come on, Oracle, you guys always up against Team New Zealand? Hmm? Yeah, America's Cup. So their boat is a head, uh, the doctor, the lead doctor has all their guys doing sauna. The cool part about doing it in Sweden is all the saunas are situated next to like cold lakes. So you're in the sauna, you're sweating, 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 you open the door, you take a few steps and you jump into an ice cold lake. Fantastic for health, fantastic for recovery. Um, in Turkey, have you guys heard of hammam? Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. You walk in, you get this like weird olive oil paste, you rub it all over yourself. Um, you go sit in like a steam room type thing, then um, you kind of, it exfoliates, and then you wash it off, and you go sit down, and then you get scrubbed, like you're getting sanded, like you're, get, you're, you're a bad piece of wood, you need to get sanded down, and they collect so much dead skin that you can, like, collect it in the palm of your hand, and afterwards, you just, like, feel so amazing. In Thailand, I got a massage therapist. I went to a blind massage place. You guys have heard of this before, right? No? So imagine where, if you don't have your sense of sight, you're getting massaged by someone that has invested years and years in their sense of touch. They can feel trigger points and things that are asymmetrical in the body much more effectively. So those are some of my experiences around the world. At that point, I knew how important rest and relaxation was. Now I was just enjoying it. Um, lifelong learning. I think that we forget how important our clients, hobbies, passions, and interests can really be in their life. It could be the anchor for inspiring more, more healthy habits to support that hobby. In Poland, um, we met the world record holder in blindfolded speed cubing. So, so he would look at a, I wish I could play this episode, I'm not going to. Um, he would look at a Rubik's cube, he'd memorize the layout, 
and he has this language that he's created, like thousands of characters. And then he, because he remembers the orientation, he closes his eyes and he just goes through what he's memorized. So he has to know thousands of combinations of this. But he is so gifted in terms of memory that he, he looked at 100 of them. So he memorized one, then the other, then the other, 100 in a row. Then he put the blindfold on. Then he went back and solved all 100 of them. He got 95 out of 100, right? 95 out of 100. So it took him eight hours. I think he memorized for an hour. Or he memorized for seven hours, and he solved in an hour. So crazy. But here, I mean, here's the most interesting part. Because he wanted to keep getting better, how do you get faster? How do you get faster? How do you get faster? He's like, well, that's when I, that's, I stopped drinking. I stopped eating sugar. I started exercising. So he started using what we're trying to get our clients to do as a way to support his hobby, as a way to support his lifestyle. And at this point, it had become his career, too, because he's performing all these Rubik's Cube tricks. And he's, he's juggling in one hand and solving a Rubik's Cube with another. And he's doing that for a living now. Um, that's for the clients, for you guys. Um, the lifelong learning, it's a challenge, really, to never stop learning. Um, challenge your own beliefs constantly, to question yourself and everything you know all the time and be okay with being wrong sometimes, not always. <laughs> Just and uh, community. If you guys want to know a little bit about your clients, find out the five people they spend the most time with. If you want to know more about yourself, look at the five people you spend the most time with. We mimic, we copy, we mirror and we match the behaviors that we see around us. Most of our programs have been in our heads since we were children, right? But one of the things I learned about community and something I really didn't appreciate before this trip was how a community can be something that we find so much more purpose and meaning within our lives. In Ethiopia, um, Israel the Jenna, he was a... Um, just a normal reggae Rastafarian type of dude, took a trip to the United States and saw this weird board on four wheels. He saw people doing crazy tricks on it. It's like, what the hell is that? Fell in love with skateboarding after he saw it. Didn't become a pro skater, but he's like, you know what? I think this can help people back at home. So he went back to Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, and he started a, um, a skateboarding park. Focus on what you have, not what you lack, and use it for positive change in the world. That's the motto that social activist Israel Dejani preaches to the hundred kids that he has taken under his wing. Today on Million Ways to Live, we're in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where Israel's skate park is transforming his local community. When people start seeing me skateboarding around the neighborhood, you know, like people thought like something attached to your feet, you know, like magic carpet kind of thing. So people got really curious. And then once you bring the skateboard out on the street and like 20, 30 kids lining up on the streets, you know, it was pretty, pretty exciting to share that love. The first time Israel saw a skateboard was on a trip to Europe and he fell in love almost immediately. When he got home, he didn't know whether or not skateboarding would resonate with the local children. That is, until he saw what kids were playing with just outside of his front door. So you're telling me that you saw kids skating on these two things? Yes. That's creative. Yeah, man. <laughs> but that's when the light bulb had to come on, like this was... Exactly. What that's a, that's not... what I know, like, you know, this is it. Mugabe Skate started with a single skateboard that had to be shared by dozens of kids. Now it's a skate park with its very own concrete half pipe. But skateboarding is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to how Israel is impacting the lives of these children. Not only is he building a computer lab and resource center for the kids, he's also inspiring them to chase their dreams. One of our activity is called the Dream Big Stage. That's where the kids perform whatever gifts that they have. Whatever they want, when they are on that stage, they are that person that they want to be or they dream to be. The Mugabe skate community has grown because of the values Israel stands for. One of the lessons that Israel teaches is that you don't need money to give back to your community. Every week, all the kids of Mugabe skate find ways to be kind and helpful to local community members. We are capable of giving back to our community. 
let's give back to our community. And then like, you know, they say like, how, how are we, we don't have money, you know? So whatever you do, it doesn't have to be like big or small, you know, you do it with a good will. And that's gonna make a big difference for the community. My advice for people who wants to give back to the community, I want them to see within themselves what they have and instead of what they are lacking of. When you see within yourself and then do whatever you have, it doesn't matter how small, how big things that, that you do, do it with love and have a positive energy, and have a positive spirit in it. And that's all it takes and it's gonna make a big difference. Yeah, man. <laughs> Our last uh, principle, love. Love was the common denominator that was across the board. Love is what made um, Megicho who lived on the Galapagos Islands. Every day for three hours a day, he picked up cigarette butts. When you go to the Galapagos Islands, they check you like you wouldn't believe. They take your bag and they scour it for anything so they can throw it out, anything that's considered a biohazard. Cigarettes are not considered a biohazard. And all the smokers there smoke, throw it on the ground. And he was so fed up with it, he just started cleaning up three hours a day. Um, he collected so many cigarette butts that he used them to make life-size mannequins for his public campaign for growing awareness of uh, smoking cigarettes and getting rid of the butts. He called one of his mannequins Nico and the other one Tina, Nico Tina. And um, yes, there you go. Um, or in Lebanon, a Sarakazm would get eight to 12 Canon cameras and travel to impoverished villages in Africa, in Asia, Mongolia, and teach kids how to take photographs. Um, so it was, it was these people finding something bigger than, them, than themselves to live their life for. It was really inspirational to be part of that. And in terms of your clients, in terms of like bringing it back down to the individual, love, or in my mind, love is really acceptance. If you fully accept yourself, then you love yourself. It's the glue that holds a healthy lifestyle together. If you guys are gonna be here tomorrow at the same time in a different room, I'll be talking about mindfulness and meditation and why clients self-sabotage goals and why you guys probably self-sabotage goals, why we all self-sabotage goals and whose fault and responsibility is it. And um, the, more, the, more, the more or the deeper I get into mindfulness and meditation, the more I realize that we're really up against something massive and without it, I don't know if change is even possible without full awareness of the situation, your behaviors, society, the things that we're dealing with as human beings. I don't know if change is possible. So that's something we'll be talking about and elaborating on further. But for, the, for this presentation, it's just, it's what makes the whole lifestyle stick. Otherwise, what happens when we're stressed out? We reach for, we reach for our bad habit. What happens on a bad day? We reach for our bad habit. Our, our alcohol, our chocolate, or whatever it happens to be. Um, do you guys want to watch one last episode? Yes. Yeah? Okay, cool. So um, <laughs> this, is, um, this was a girl we found on Instagram before we even, by the way, some of the ways that we found people, we landed in a country, and we'd have eight days to find someone, film it, edit it, and leave. And... Like sometimes we'd walk into a hostel and we'll ask the hostel person, the front desk worker, hey, do you know someone that does graffiti art and does like, oh yeah, I know this person. I'm like, perfect, that's why we're supposed to stay here. So I would say that 50% of the trip was completely improvised and I'm amazed at some of the stories we got. But then there was girls like, um, I even forget her name, but Girl With Cake, we'll call her Girl With Cake. Then there was girls like Girl With Cake. And we knew about her beforehand, so let's share her story now. If there's one thing we need more of in this world, it would definitely be kindness. A close second is probably delicious cake. Social activist Nareen Gardner combines the two and has come to be known around the world simply as Girl With Cake. Today on Million Ways to Live, we're in Johannesburg, South Africa, where Nareen is spreading unconditional kindness one cake at a time.
Girl with Cake is an initiative Noreen started which gives cake to the less fortunate simply because she believes everyone deserves a cake made with love. For those that have been dealt a raw deal in life, at least for a few moments, they too feel the joy of a delicious cake. I grew up in a family where baking for someone is like showing love. Mom would bake for us if she wished us good luck or if we were sad or just if she wanted to be like, hey, I love you. <laughs> so before I started, we had a really bad experience with people and went through a really long time where we felt like everyone was just bad. Like, would it be easier for us if we just accepted that people in general were bad? <laughs> I actually ran into a, um, an ex-creative director of mine and I told him what I thought I'd learned. And then he said, the minute you stop um, seeing the good in other people, you lose the ability to be good yourself. And then I thought about that and started looking for nice things in people and good things people were doing and it became true for me because the more I was like seeing good in other people, the more I wanted to be good. And then finally in this like one terrible week where everyone was depressed, I was like, okay, well found it, I'm gonna do something. And then this is what I did. Noreen has baked nearly 50 cakes for people in her local community. Each cake has provided her with joy, happiness, and even deep life lessons. She recalls one cake specifically that gave her perspective that she remembers to this day. It took me really long to make a cake, and it was amazing, and I took it to work with me, and everyone the whole day just kept like, going on about how amazing it was and how beautiful it was, and I got like a bit, like, huh, I made a pretty good cake. And then got to this guy who'd come from Kenya, and he hadn't eaten in two days. He didn't say thank you, he didn't react, and I was like a little shocked. And then he asked me if, if, he, if I had a bag so he could hide the cake in it. And then I was like, why would you want to hide my beautiful cake? And then as I put it in the bag, I kind of like saw one of the biscuits push up and I was like, oh, my cake is getting ruined. And I'm like, just like, it was that moment where I was like, oh, stupid. Like, I'm so worried about living life well. And he's like worried about living. And I think the like realization that you have to give without expecting anything in return. And that goes for thank yous as well. You can't give because you want someone to say thank you. Or someone to be happy, or, like, you know, to tell you you're amazing because you know, he has something to eat for two days. Baking a cake for the poor and poverty stricken may not be the solution to economic and social problems, but it's surely something positive. Noreen shows that regardless of how small, anyone can be kind to the people around them. She knows that what she's really giving people is much more than just a sweet dessert. The cake in the, in the bag is like just how you get to connect with someone. A lot of these people that we've met just want to talk. Someone just needs to listen. Like no one does. You're just used to like, you know, looking away because it's easier. If you let it in and you're like realistic about it, then you can start doing something. But if you ignore it, then we're just all going to live separately and it's just going to keep happening until it overwhelms you. Yes. <laughs> yes, we saw you up there and then you left and we thought we'd stop you and give you a cake. My name's Noreen. I'm, I'm Prince. Man. Prince. Yes, man. Prince, it's nice to meet you. It's not real if it's not unconditional, because I feel like, like if there's a reason other than wanting that person to be happy, then it's not really about that person's happiness. You help me with my eyes. Okay, I'm glad. <laughs> I don't know what can I do. No, nothing, nothing. It's just for love. Yeah, you said that's nothing. Yeah, it's nothing. I just <laughs> want you to be a little bit happy. And have a nice night. Let's have something sweet. I think people see kindness as it has to be like a really big thing and I don't think that's necessary. I think if you do like something little and simple, even if it's like the smallest thing, if you're putting a lot of love into it, someone will feel that. Good thing to be putting out into the world. <laughs> okay friends, have a good night. I'll see you again. Okay. <laughs> Bye friends. <laughs> So what about you guys? What's in it for you guys, this whole presentation? Um, I think there's so much to learn from opposing viewpoints. I don't know the amount of times that I've been humbled every time I've rejected something just because it's something different than I believed in or I was following. And yet when I just opened my eyes and opened myself up to what they were teaching, most, mostly I saw similarities between what was being said and what I believed myself anyway. So stay open-minded and accepting, continue learning. And um, also, hopefully, um, kind of inspiration to create a career in life that you want. I was, uh, I was a c certified public accountant working in a cubicle. 
and I decided to become a personal trainer, and my family was like, are you effing crazy? I'm like, I think I know what I'm doing, and um, it's because I loved it. I love learning about the human body. I love learning what makes, how people move, why they move, how to make them move differently, how to change them for the better, for healthy, for, to make them healthier. And now I love what makes them think, so that's why I'm into the whole mindfulness meditation thing, why they behave the way they do. So there's a quote, find what you love and let it kill you. So hopefully you guys can follow your passion and dreams within this industry because there's so many opportunities to do whatever you want. And for your clients, listen to your clients, honor their and respect their beliefs. Um, you'll probably learn a lot from your clients. In fact, that's gonna be your greatest source of continued education for the rest of your careers. Every client has so much to teach you. Um, and help them, help them create a healthy lifestyle that works for them with their goals. You have these six big rocks. You don't need technical jargon. You don't need these complex <laughs> words to confuse them or to educate them. They know enough about their lives to be the master of their own lives. We need to empower them and get the big things sorted before we worry about the little things. If they eat healthy, move, rest and recover, sleep, hydrate, and they've got good people around them, I'm pretty sure the body will take care of itself. I think sometimes we forget and we lose that focus that the body, the body will always heal itself if you put it in the right environment. Like we're not magicians. We don't say hocus pocus and you're healed, no. We just put them in an environment and then the body takes care of, this, takes care of itself. Yeah. So thank you guys, A Million Ways to Live. The book is available on Amazon and Kindle. Um, the international documentary web series, it's 56 episodes. It's at millionwaystolive.com. And um, if you guys want to connect, I don't do Facebook. I'm on the social network. I, I deleted all social media except LinkedIn because no one checks LinkedIn. Um, I don't even know why it exists. I never log in. So that's me on LinkedIn. Or you can email me, which is like receiving like a, a letter, a nicely written letter from someone nowadays. When you get a personal email, it's like, oh, wow, you didn't need Facebook to reach out to me? Thank you. So reach out if you guys want to connect and um, would appreciate session feedback. If it's in your apps. Just follow those simple directions and uh, let me know what you guys thought of the presentation. And we've got about 10 minutes. If you guys have any questions, I'll... Thank you, guys.